Good morning and welcome to New Milton Evangelical Free Church's online service. Uh, we're going to, in a moment, pray, but before we do that, we're going to remind ourselves of what the Bible says. The Bible says, May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say, The Lord is great. Let's come to this great God in prayer. Loving Father, as we come to you this morning, we thank you that... Uh, we come as those who know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Saviour. We come as those who have um, understood that salvation is to be found in him and him alone. We pray that you'd speak to us through this service. We ask that we might grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you'd minister to us. Uh, help us to understand what we hear. Help us to understand your word preached and explained and read. And help us to join in the singing from, um, as it were, the bottom of our hearts, Lord, that we would praise you with all that we have. We pray that you, Lord, would make yourself known to us. If there's anyone, Lord, who is watching this who does not know you, open the eyes of their understanding that they might know you as their Lord and Saviour. And so we cry out to you for this, for Jesus' sake. Amen. So we're going to sing and uh, remind us how, uh, remind ourselves how, how great thou art. Um, as we sing that and Martin and Annette will lead us in it.
So it's time again to go over to Giles. Um, it would be lovely if one time we went over to him, he was ready. We'll see what happens today. Over to you, Giles. <laughs> Nice, shiny clean teeth, ready to face the day. Oh, it's the children's talk. I'm late for the children's talk. Hi, uh, Simeon, I was just brushing my teeth. Um, do you remember last week, uh, Gareth uh, told us he used to be a dentist? Yes, and it reminded me that um, if I don't brush my teeth thoroughly every day, I'll end up with a quacked tooth. Do you remember? Uh, good dad joke there, Gareth. A quacked tooth. You don't want that added to your bill, do you? <laughs> anyway, children's talk. So, good morning, children. Really nice to see you. Now, I hope you remember that before last week in Gareth's message, we'd been thinking about not swatting flies midair with our hands, but when we pray. When we pray is when we're just simply talking to God, isn't it? But when we talk to God, we remember who he is and what he's like. He's God almighty. There's nothing he cannot do. He's God who's always present to see us, to hear everything we say and even to know our thoughts. And we always pray in Jesus' name. Now, why do we do that? Well, because Jesus is a name above all other names. Jesus is the only one who makes it possible for you and me to be able to come before God who's holy. And then last time we thought about where we pray. We pray together in church or at the moment, not in the church building, but via the computer, but together. We thought about how sometimes we pray not together in church with our family, but also alone. And that's good. Now this week, I've got a question for you. My question is this. When you pray, do you always do that? Do you always join your hands together? Maybe not flat like that, but with your fingers interfolded like that. And do you always close your eyes? Hmm. And have you ever wondered, why on earth do we actually do that? I mean, it doesn't do anything magical joining your hands together or shutting your eyes, does it? Well, the answer is quite simple. You see, if you're anything like me, then if you don't have your hands joined together, then you might just find yourself fiddling with something as a distraction. Or you just eyes wandering and you see something and it distracts you, doesn't it? So the reason why sometimes we pray with our eyes shut and hands joined is just to help us to stay concentrating and remember uh, what we're speaking to God about. Keep focused. And that's good. But that doesn't mean that's the only way that we can pray, is it? And we can only pray in that way. We can pray, perhaps, for example, in an emergency. And we don't have time to kneel or put our hands together or shut our eyes. We can still pray. Or suppose there's this situation. Oh, oh, oh. Just suppose, oops, just suppose there you are hurtling down a really steep hill or really rugged terrain, chugging away, and you decide, I really want to pray. Oopsie daisy. And suppose you take your hands off the handlebars, join them together to pray, and you shut your eyes. And there you are, heading for a thumping great big tree stump. Oh dear, that's not going to end well, is it? Bad times. Now this reminded me of a really good true story from the Bible that I thought I'd share with you this morning to help us understand this. Now in the Old Testament, there's a man called Nehemiah. He's one of God's people and he was one of those that were made to live in the far off land of Persia where he served the king 
his wine. Now, Nehemiah was dead thrilled one day because he found out that one of his brothers was going to come and pay him a visit. Now, as you do when you haven't seen a member of your family for a long while, you have a catch up, don't you? And so he said, so how are things back home, back home in God's city, Jerusalem? Well, it was really bad news. I mean, really bad news. The brother said, the people are all really really poor and in desperate trouble and the walls of the city well they've been smashed down like lego pieces on the floor and what's more that the city gates have been burned up in fire well you can imagine can't you nehemiah was really really sad hmm. next nehemiah was back on duty serving the king his wine Chug, 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 Nice wine for the king. And the king noticed. He said, Nehemiah, why do you look like this? Is your heart sad? Nehemiah answered, I just can't help it, O king. I just can't help it. My people are all really poor. The city of my people has been smashed down like Lego pieces all over the carpet floor and its gates have been burned up with fire. And the king asked, what would you like to do? Then, dan, 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 Nehemiah prayed right there before the king. He couldn't close his eyes and he, he couldn't join his hands together like that. I mean, let's face it, when your job is to serve the king his wine, if you do that and drop his wine, his favourite wine, all over the floor, well, you're going to be in right big trouble, aren't you? But he prayed to God saying, please, God, please, will you make the king kind and good for this moment? And so he asked the king, he said, if it's all right with you, O king, I'd like to go back and help my people rebuild the city, the city walls that are like Lego bricks all over the floor. Can you please let me go? And do you know what happened next? That's right. The king said, go. And he even sent him with soldiers to help him get there safely. See, even whilst Nehemiah was stood there in front of the king, God heard his prayer and responded, making the king good and kind. Nehemiah didn't say his prayer out loud with his mouth. He said it in his heart to God quietly. And God heard and answered, even though the king obviously couldn't hear a single word coming out of Nehemiah's mouth because he didn't say it out loud. He spoke to God in prayer in his heart silently and we can do that too can't we we can pray when we're busy working on schoolwork or helping mum and dad do some chores around the house or whilst we're playing with friends or family in the garden or even whilst we're riding our bikes down that steep rugged hill towards the tree uh, trunk without ending up breaking our faces on it you see if we uh, uh, pray to God like Nehemiah did. It might be in a situation where we want God's help right away. It might be an emergency. Or we uh, may want to pray not with our eyes closed and our hands joined. And that's okay. You see, God likes to hear from his people often. And we should, just like Nehemiah, pray uh, when we need to. As well as those times when we meet together and join hands and close our eyes and that leads us neatly to our memory verse this week it's the same one we did last time because we had a week's gap it's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verses 16 to 18 be joyful always pray continually give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus wonderful words. Let's finish by praying. Our loving Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you and praise you that we are able to come to you by praying, sometimes with our hands joined together and our eyes closed. At other times, 
just like Nehemiah did before the king, silently in our hearts. And we thank you and praise you that you hear our prayers and that you respond. And Lord, we pray for the children in our church that, Lord, you will bless each one of them and that you will enable them to be uh, young men and women of God who uh, will grow up to pray to you often and that you would delight to hear their prayers and answer. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of the service. So thank you for that, Giles. And uh, we're going to now sing and we're going to sing about a different way of praying. Uh, Before you I kneel, my master and maker and uh, the lovely Claire is going to lead us in this. So it's time now to read from the Bible and uh, Noah's going to read the Bible to us. Luke chapter 9 verses 57 to 62. As they were walking along the road, a man said to them, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, First let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus said, No one who puts a hand to the plough and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. So Lord and Father, as we come to you again, we want to thank you and praise you for the way that you continue to work in our lives. We thank you for, uh, Lord, the grace that you've given us through the period of lockdown. And Lord, we uh, also lift our voices to you in thanks that some of the lockdown measures are being um, relaxed, as it were, and that we're able to get back to shops and to, uh, Lord, perhaps continue to live in a bit more of a normal way. So we thank you for that. But we do ask for safety and for wisdom in people's conduct. We recognise that uh, uh, given an inch, some would take a mile. So we pray, Lord, that in your grace that you would protect us and protect us as a nation and protect us as your people, Lord, we would ask. We pray for the government, um, who would, that they would be guided in the Lord, by the Lord in all that they do. Um, we pray for a vaccine to um, deal with the coronavirus. We ask, Lord, that you would uh, bring that about and that it would be uh, available all around the world lord that it would be able to be mass produced so we just commit that to you 
We continue to pray for those who are recovering from COVID-19. Lord, we think of our own sister Addie. Lord, we pray that you'd be with her and help her to know full uh, recovery from all that she has been through. We ask, Lord, for your grace to be upon your people. Um, we pray that your uh, you would enable your people to continue to share the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, about, amongst neighbours and friends and family, Lord, that there might be a turning to you, Lord, even as a result of this coronavirus. Lord, you are the one who can bring all things for good, and so we pray you would in the midst of this situation. Father, we pray also, Lord, for Christians around the world. Uh, we pray particularly for those who are facing persecution, who uh, simply by um, owning the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, have acknowledged him as, him as Lord and Saviour, uh, come under risk even of losing their lives. And so we pray that you'd be near to them, Lord. We think of those in China and Eritrea and, uh, uh, Lord, multiple other places around our globe, Lord, that need your protection. And so we pray that you would do that today. We pray, Lord, as well for the blessing of godly leaders in uh, both the church and in the state, Lord. We ask that you would raise up godly men and women who will lead in ways that will uh, move this nation and move this world forward in terms of living for you, in terms of uh, a future, Lord, which is, is uh, good. But Lord, we recognise that you have said that we will face injustice, we'll face difficulty and hardship until the Lord Jesus Christ returns. And so even as we think about these things, we look forward to that day in which the Lord Jesus Christ returns and we say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Uh, and so we ask in Jesus name. Amen. Well, in all of life, we need the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're going to sing the next song, which reminds us of that. It's um, going to be sung by Martin and Annette again, and it's called For This I Have Jesus. Each day for the nights 
of doubt and worry when sleep has fled away. Needing reassurance and the will to start again. A steely-eyed endurance, the strength to fight and win. For this I have Jesus, for this I have Jesus, for this I have Jesus, I have Jesus. Jesus, for this I have Jesus, for this I have Jesus, I have Jesus. So if you'd like to turn in your Bibles then to Luke chapter 9 and we're looking at verses 57 through to 62. Uh, and I'll ask the question, do you really want Christ? Do you really want Christ? Now, in the age in which we live, um, the age of acceptance of anything, any belief, any philosophy, any lifestyle, except Christ and the Christian life, it might seem a strange question to ask. Do you really want him? Aren't we normally more concerned with getting the gospel a hearing, getting people to actually listen to, understand that Jesus Christ died for them? Aren't we more interested in, in getting the gospel across in that way uh, more often? Yeah, just getting the hearing because people just aren't interested in, in hearing. Now that's changed a little bit in the COVID period, but still by and large Christianity is, is not um, valued or, or seen as important in our society. Uh, wouldn't we be, or rather shouldn't we be, content with simply getting people to come along to church, to, to tune into these online services that they might hear the gospel? Shouldn't we be content with that? You know, uh, and, and isn't it a breakthrough when we finally get them into a service? Well, here in the passage, we discover that Jesus is not remotely interested in hangers on. He's not interested in people just coming along for the ride. He's interested in people who understand who he is and live their lives accordingly. Jesus is looking for people who truly want him above all else. Now this passage comes after Jesus has shown uh, something of his glory to three of the disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration. You uh, remember that he, uh, as it were, glowed uh, as uh, white as, uh, well, um, as any washing could ever be done, or whiter than snow. He was radiant with the glory of God. He was uh, in, in such a way. And those three disciples saw that and, and uh, were lost for words, didn't know what to do in the midst of that experience of seeing his glory. And after all that, he comes down that uh, uh, mount, he comes down and he deals with a demon-possessed boy. He deals with a boy who, who has uh, been convulsing and uh, is possessed by a demon and the Lord Jesus throws out the demon. And so his disciples at large see uh, the power of God at work through him. And then uh, we read in the passage as it continues on, we discover that uh, as they continue on their way, there is a discussion as to who is the greatest among them. You know, those disciples, instead of uh, thinking about the Lord Jesus and, and being wowed and awed by who he is, are simply uh, concerned about their own ends, concerned about who will be the greatest in this kingdom uh, that uh, Jesus will usher in. And then we discover that they face opposition as they go among the Samaritans. They are uh, sent, not interested in them. They, they just sent packing and, and that upsets the disciples. And all of this happens before we get to here. And then just following this little section, we have the sending out of the 70 or 72 uh, disciples uh, to go out and to be witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. And it comes really in that passage as a question uh, for us, who is really with me? It comes from Jesus. It's a question, who is really with me? Who is really following me and doing uh, what is required of them? 
It may be that you've been dabbling in Christianity. Um, you have dipped your toe in the water uh, and uh, you are where these, uh, some of these disciples around the Lord Jesus Christ are in their thinking. You are a bit torn. Uh, you've seen, uh, on the one hand, you've seen who, who Jesus is. You can see that he is the Son of God. You've worked that out. You've, you've understood that he has power and authority. You've, you've seen the potential for that, for good in, with all that power that is, is at uh, the Lord Jesus' fingertips, as it were. Uh, but then there is the hard time that you will get for following Jesus. People will laugh. They will mock you for what you believe. It might even ruin your career. Uh, you might be in an industry that views Christians very uh, well with uh, thought that you can't possibly, no thinking person can possibly be a Christian. It might ruin your career prospects, even if it doesn't mean that you get the sack there and then. Or it could be lonely saying goodbye to all your friends who think that you've gone mad. What should you do? What should I do might be the question that comes. Well, Jesus teaches us in this passage that there are three things that need, we need to understand when it comes to following him. Now, you don't, you don't need to mishear me. I'm not telling you that you do these things to earn God's approval. But what I'm telling you is that if you accept the gospel, if you accept that Jesus Christ died for your sin, if you accept that he is your Lord and Saviour, then these things should be true of you. These things should be evident in your life. And the first thing we see in the passage is that Christ is to be our security and our comfort. That comes in verses 57 uh, and 58. There is a man who is with Jesus, they're on the path, they're on the way, um, and he asserts that he will follow Jesus anywhere. He, he basically says, look, Jesus, I'm going to go with you wherever you go. Well, we see in the text that Jesus is less than convinced. His uh, response is not, that's great, come along then. You see, Jesus isn't interested in bravado. He's not interested in people who sort of uh, throw them their, their lot in with him and say, you know, I'm going to give everything, I'm going to go everywhere with you. And then it turns out that you're not really there. He's not interested in that bravado. It's rather Jesus throws the question, do you understand what following me really means? Have you counted the cost? And he says, I've got nowhere to lay my head. I, I don't have anywhere that I call my own in this life. There is no place that is mine. You know, even animals, and that's the comparison, even animals in this life have their nests. They have their homes, but Jesus' followers do not. Well, does that mean that every true follower of Jesus is homeless and lives on the streets? Well, that's not really what this verse is saying, is it? If you remember, Peter had a home. And we know that because Jesus visits him. If you remember later on, you discover that Mark's mum has a home and uses it for ministry. And Lydia has a, a home in Philippi and, and it, uh, she isn't asked to give it up. And you could go on. There are other examples of those who had homes that uh, they could use for God's glory. So it's not so much talking then about a physical home as the significance of a physical home in this world. A home is a place of security and of comfort. That's usually how you understand a home to be. It's the place where you long to be when you're away from it. It's the place where you feel the safest. It's the place that you are grounded by, as it were. You can go all around the world, but you feel that you are, that's one place that you are rooted. It's a place of security and comfort, a place of stability and a place of belonging. Now, every true follower of Jesus makes Jesus himself their home, their place of security. That is exactly what um, Jesus is getting at here. 
And why is that important? Why, why, why is it that we don't view, uh, as it were, the homes in which we live, the, uh, the place in which we, we gather, uh, why is it that we don't view these things as being uh, eternally significant? Well, it means when we view Jesus as our home, when we view him as the one that we uh, follow and, uh, and cling to, and see as our security and, um, and our comfort, then it means that we are not distracted by the temporary. Uh, too many po people are focused on making their homes comfortable. Uh, too many uh, people use their spare income. It goes on making everything just so. You go round to the home, it's pristine. Everything is beautiful. It's all uh, ornate. It's lovely. And, and you go round it and you can't help wishing that, uh, you know, that you had something a little bit like it. And the decisions that they make are on changes in their lives are made assessing whether the impact on the home will be beneficial or not usually asking the question will it add to our comfort you know, if we do this will we be better off uh, before or after where which which way should we go and usually people in the world do not make moves that will uh, co cost them in any way any material thing in this life it, sometimes they do but usually uh, the by far the most predominant uh, thing is that they uh, make decisions that are most comfortable well if christ is your home your dwelling place then bricks and mortar the bricks and mortar that you live in or if you're in a, a static home or wherever you live um, that nest that you make for yourself will be what he provides and you will be content with that whether that is a tent, whether that is a house, whether that's a temporary accommodation for a while, whatever it is, because your home and your security is in Jesus, those things aren't so much important to you. And even if he asks you to move and buy a worse house to go to a different place that he wants you to be in, then you're able to do that because your security and your comfort is not based on where you live or the house that you live in or even the group that you live with. So then even if he asks you to become a missionary to the poor in India or in Africa or any other place around the world that you never really thought that you wanted to go, but God asks you to go there. Well, what the world sees as security and comfort to the Christian are simply the gracious window dressings that accompany the dwelling of Christ, which is eternal. So we can cope without all of the uh, comforts that this world longs for, that the people of this world long for. So let me ask you the question, is that true of you? Are you able to live for Christ today, whether he asks you to stay where you are or to go somewhere else? Or, or when it comes to that and God challenges you in your life, will you be prepared to move on? Uh, do you trot out the list of the creature comforts that you will need before you will act? Before you will even consider it? If that's the case, then you are getting your security and your comfort from things and not from Christ. So you perhaps need to rethink where you are second thing we see in the text is not only is christ to be our security and our comfort but he is also to be our family that comes in verses 59 and 60 now on the face of it it seems an unusually harsh line that jesus is taking uh, jesus turns to a man as they're walking along and he says to him look follow me but the man turns to him and he says first let me go and bury my father well, Jesus replies, let the dead bury the dead. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems a jolly insensitive reply, doesn't it? Certainly on the surface. Well, what is going on? Is Jesus really saying that Christians shouldn't be involved in their parents' funerals? Is that what's going on in the text? 
Well, I think some things that we should note uh, about this situation, and the, the first is the reality that the man would not have been out listening to a rabbi, to Jesus, had his dad died that day. You see, he would have been in uh, his period of mourning. He would have been with his family. He would have been then going to the burial because the burial would have occurred usually on the same day as, as the death. So I don't think Jesus is talking to a man whose father has just literally uh, died and he's got to go and bury him. There's something else going on here. What's more likely is he is talking about his responsibilities as an elder son. In the reburying of the bones in the tomb wall and usually that happened a year after they had been buried so they were put into the uh, tomb um, they were left for a year and of course uh, all of that which was flesh uh, disintegrates and, and goes away um, and all you're left with is bones and those bones were put into a special box and then put into the uh, tomb wall and so what's most likely going on here is that this man is is saying, well, I will follow you after I have done what needs to be done, after uh, I have fulfilled my um, family responsibilities, as it were. He could actually have been asking for anything up to a year to, to, to sort these things out. So, so he's saying to Jesus, as Jesus has said to him, follow me, he said to him, well, I will do, but only when I'm ready. So what's the point of what Jesus is saying? Well, following Jesus is the Christian's greatest priority. He is their chief family member, if I can put it like that. So this man felt that he had a responsibility to his father. He had a responsibility to his family to see through what he saw as uh, were, what were his uh, family obligations. Well, if you like, Jesus is our chief family commitment. When it comes to a choice between doing what Christ wants and fulfilling family obligations, Christ always trumps the family. Mm, now that's radical, isn't it? That would have been a radical thought for that man. And even today in our situation, we find it difficult, don't we, to think of putting Christ before our families. He could well have been ostracized from his family for not carrying out his responsibilities. They could have disowned him, as it were, almost as the elder brother. But such is the commitment, such is the nature of following Jesus that even our families take second place to him. So does that mean that we don't look after our families? Well, it certainly doesn't. Uh, you remember Peter, I said Jesus visited his home. You remember on one of those occasions that Jesus visited Peter's home, he looks after um, Peter's mother-in-law. She was ill. And so Peter and his wife are looking after their mother-in-law. So it's not telling us that you should not look after your family. It's, it has, there's nothing of that in it. And the New Testament actually makes it plain that it is the grown child's responsibility to look after the parents when their time comes. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 4, But if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn, first of all, to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents. For this is pleasing to God. So this isn't talking about abandoning family members. And so please don't dress it up in that way. Please don't say that it is Christ or the family. But what it is telling you is that Christ is your chief family member. And in all of this, all that God calls you to do, there is no compromising of following Christ. He is the first priority. So as our first priority, we then do what he tells us that we should do. And one of those things is looking after our family. But if we make our family an excuse for not following Jesus, then we are going the wrong way. What our text says, it boils down to, is what displays the priorities of the kingdom? What is it that makes the gospel the paramount thing? 
There are things that are, are that take place in non-believers, fa non-believing family members' lives that they can do themselves that we do not need to be drawn into. That do not require us to drop everything to fulfil their desires or their uh, or the society's pressure, as it were, on us to conform. And we don't drop everything and we do what Jesus wants. Why? In order that we might show that Jesus Christ comes first. Now, please don't get me wrong. I know families are tricky. I've got extended family and, uh, you, and families can be interesting. But I have seen many people for the sake of the family shift their priorities. And usually they shift their priorities around meeting together with God's people to accommodate regular visits uh, that, uh, from family members that mean that Christ is portrayed as not that important. Now, I, please don't get me wrong, just occasionally you'll get a visit from family and it, and it disrupts your uh, regular schedule. I'm not talking about that. But there are times when we make it so that we are uh, dealing with family when we should be dealing with Christ. Imagine the situation if you're, if you're in one of these, um, if you're one of those that have struggled with that in, in some way. Imagine the situation. Maybe it's your children uh, that you're making time for. They're not believers. And uh, they come to visit you regularly on a Sunday. Well, imagine the conversation that they might have with a, with a friend. Oh, yeah, my parents are Christians, you know, but they don't take it too seriously. If we turn up on a Sunday, they'll stay at home. You know, they're, they're not into it so much that they, they don't care about us, as it were. Um, you know, they, they, they never turn us away. We're always allowed to go there. When you say, well, that sounds like a good thing, isn't it? If we show that we're always ready for our family. Well, if you have given the impression that Christ really doesn't mean that much, then there's a problem. Uh, let me suggest the, foot's on, uh, the shoes on the other foot, as it were. You try ringing your child and suggesting that you're going to visit on such and such an occasion. And I guess you'll probably get some excuse like this. Well, you can't come then, Mum. I have my Zumba class and I can't miss that. You see, it's funny, isn't it? Our family members are allowed to have their priorities. And if we go and try and press in on their world, then they won't be budged. But suddenly, when it comes to Christ, we throw all of that out of the window and we move everything in order that our family might have our time. Well, there's a problem there. And here is this man who is simply wanting to carry out family responsibilities. And Jesus says, look, I come first. Do you believe that? Are you prepared to live for Jesus in that way? Have you counted that cost? Christ is to be the third thing I want you to see is Christ is to be our focus, and that comes in verses 61 and 62. Again, Jesus' response to a request to simply go home and say goodbye to the family seems to exact from him a rather radical response. Let me suggest that in truth, the answer that Jesus gives the man, it seems to imply that the man is not simply asking to go home for a quick goodbye. I don't think that's really what's being got out in the text at all. Uh, most likely the man can't bear the thought of leaving and his desire is to remain. And so Jesus has asked him to come, but he's saying, well, yeah, but yeah, I, I think I just need to. Um, do you mind if I just go over here and, and, uh, and, and sort that out before? So it's not really a wholehearted serving of Jesus. In fact, it's a uh, deliberate wanting to go back. And Jesus uses that illustration. He uses the illustration of a plowman who, instead of focusing on where he is going, because when you're plowing, you have to mark a line and keep going towards it. Well, instead of doing that, the man is constantly looking behind him. And well, when you do that when you're ploughing, even if you are following oxen or, 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 doing, uh, or pushing a hand plough, what, if you're not concentrating on where you're going, all you're doing is creating a mess behind you. Right? Because you're heading off in the wrong direction. You're ploughing a furrow, which is anything but straight. 
and not following what's gone before. In fact, as the text says, you are not a plowman fit for the job. You'd get the sack. So the implication then is that in following Jesus, he is to become our focus. He is to be our whole purpose and what, who we are to fix our eyes thoroughly upon. Well, the children of Israel illustrate the looking back issue rather well, don't they? When they came out of Egypt and they are in the wilderness, they are heading towards the promised land. And in, instead of having their eyes on where they're going on, on, and uh, on what God is doing for them, they keep looking back. And the moment they hit a bump in the road, they don't think about how Jesus will get them through. They think about what they had. It's one of the funniest verses in the Bible, if you ask me. But Numbers um, chapter 11 and verses 4 to 6. If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish that we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. God was providing for them. They had what they needed. But they kept looking back and looking back with longing. You see, they, they could remember all the good things of the past that seemed so good to them as they were there in the desert. But never mind the fact that they were in bondage. Never mind the fact that they were slaves and were suffering and that God had rescued them from it. They valued what they lost more than what they had in the God who had rescued them. And you know, that's one of the dangers of following Jesus. You keep looking back to your old life and thinking well life was so much easier then so much and then you forget the bondage that you were under you forget the pain that you dealt with you forget the weight of your sin so what is Jesus point don't follow me unless you know what you are giving up and what you are gaining and when you do follow me do it with all your heart. You see, faith in Jesus is the complete abandoning or abandonment of self and any other crutch upon which you would lean. It is understanding that all that the world clings to is as nothing compared to knowing Christ. All your sins are forgiven. Christ's righteousness is given to you. A new heart and a new spirit is within you. You are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You're empowered for life. And there will be suffering. The Bible clearly says that. But there will be eternal life. And an eternal dwelling that is secured in the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you really swap that for a nice house, for an easy life, for your fill of pleasure, and then an eternity of suffering without Christ? Put your faith in Christ. Count the cost, yes. Make sure you understand that living for Jesus is turning your back on all of these creature comforts. Uh, turning your back on, well, what society says that you should do. Turning your back on what you thought you once had. And looking instead to Christ. Put your faith in Christ. Make him your security and comfort, uh, your family and your focus. And then see what God will do. Live life to the max. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you'd help us to be those that understand that following the Lord Jesus has a cost on our part. Lord, it's not a, a real cost in terms of what we gain in eternity, but Lord, it is a cost and it is a, a cost that we must count now. Father, we pray, forgive us if we've been going wrong. Forgive us if we've got our focus onto the things of this life and not on the eternal uh, not on the Lord Jesus Christ. So forgive us for that, we pray. But Lord, we ask that you would move us to understand just what we have in Christ. 
that we might understand that uh, well giving up the world is nothing because we have gained everything in the Lord Jesus Christ Father keep us from well seeking the world and losing our souls we ask in Jesus name Amen so as we're thinking about following the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, the next song reminds us that um, once upon a time we held dear the things of the world but now we hold dear the things of the Lord Jesus Christ all I once held dear and uh, Philippa and Will will lead us in this Thank you very much for joining us for this service this Sunday. Uh, we pray that the Lord will work powerfully in your lives, that you will know the preciousness of having the Lord Jesus Christ close and that you will know what it is to uh, live your life for him through this coming week. Bye for now. See you next time.